on chapter number six. We might get out of here early tonight. It's only been 15 minutes. Lord. John chapter number six. Yeah, there we go. That's better. I can hear me. John chapter number six and verse number one. Is it there? April, can you cut this off for me? I think that might be why it's... What number is that? What number is your mic? It's the gray one. It's the one Kittle has. Let me turn it down. Yeah, that's what How about this? That's good right there. Yeah, there we go. Y'all don't worry. We're going to vote on getting all this stuff fixed next week. <laughs> right. It'll be fixed next week. Lord willing, if y'all vote the right way. John, <laughs> chapter, it's all on y'all and how you vote, amen. John, chapter number six and verse number one. So we're continuing our study through the book of John. It says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were deceased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. The Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come with him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? This he said to prove him. And I love where we're at in the word of God. Sorry, verse number six. This he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? <laughs> Verse number 10, Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled... He said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Verse 15. Where we're, no, we're done at 14. Um, Brother uh, Jason, would you ask the Lord to bless the preaching tonight, please, sir? Lord, we come to you again, thanking you for this opportunity to be in thy house and worship you, Lord. Lord, just now we just thank you for the word that he's already read. Lord, just give him the word that we need to hear. Give him just lay upon his heart what he needs to say and what we need to hear, so we can apply it to our everyday lives. Lord, Lord, we just can't thank you enough for everything that you do for us each and every day. In your name, I pray. Amen. 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 We're talking about a multiplier tonight. Here's my introduction. When I hold a basketball in my hand, you know what I'm able to do with that? Probably dribble. I might make a shot. I might not make a shot. I might I might mess up and walk. I might mess up and throw the ball the wrong way. I might shoot and totally miss it and hit an air ball. But you know what you'd do if you'd put that ball in LeBron James's hands? You'd put that same basketball in the hands of LeBron James. You'd have it multiplies in the three NBA championships, four league MVPs, and two Olympic gold medals. Now, I'd much rather see Michael Jordan there, but my, LeBron is who I'm using as my illustration. <laughs> you place the golf club in my hands, you know what? You're probably going to get four. <laughs> Watch out. The ball's coming. It's going to hit you in the head. It might land in the sand. It might land in the lake, in the water. The alligator might get it, and then you really got to play it where it stands or where it lands. If you can put it in my hands, I ain't going to do nothing with a golf ball but hit it and mess up. If you place that in the hands of Tiger Woods, you've got multiple championships. If you put a football in my hands, I might be able to throw a, throw a touchdown pass from this end to that end. We've proved that with the teenagers out there. Or I might fumble it. I might drop it. I might not even be able to pass it. Nobody be able to catch it. If you put a football in the hands of Peyton Manning, it multiplies into four Super Bowls. With two wins, pretty good, ain't it? Amen. It's all in who you multi, who you're 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 putting it in the hands of. A paintbrush in my hands. Tell you what, I'm not a big artist. And if I had a paintbrush, I might take that paintbrush and I would draw this, this, boom, 
boom, boom, put a head on them, what you got? A stick figure. That's about all I can do with a paintbrush. But look at what Picasso was able to paint. Look at Michelangelo, what he was able to paint. You put it in the right hands, it multiplies into something way bigger than what you and I can do. How is it that the same thing can bring about such dramatic and different results? How is that? Because it's in whose hands it's in. Amen. God's give some of us talents that he didn't give others. Right. God's give some things to people that he didn't give to others. In John chapter 6, Jesus is at the height of his popularity. You know why? Because he's getting ready to feed 5,000 people. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you be there? Mm -hmm. First thing I asked Miss Pat this morning, and I've asked her every time, I think since I've been announcing about the senior fellowship, we're going to eat. First thing I said when I said we was going to do uh, Old Fashioned Sunday, I said we're going to eat. We have youth night. First thing we talk about, what we're going to eat. We have men's brotherhood. First thing we talk about, what we're going to eat. Ladies meetings, y'all excited because you're getting ready to eat. Oh. Uh, Baptists love to eat. Amen. I love to eat, amen. amen. Whether it's chicken, meatloaf, banana pudding, uh, breadsticks and pizza, or garlic bread and wings, it don't matter to me, I'm good. Let's go at it. Let's have some food. So, of course, Jesus is at the height of his popularity. Anytime you feed Baptists, they're going to come. Amen. Anytime you feed anybody, they're going to come. Amen. When you get free food, it's there. Uh, he just healed a crippled man of 38 years on the Sabbath. Of course, like we said last week, that didn't sit too well with the Pharisees. Because as we talked about last week, they're all about the law. They're all about what tradition says. And I'm glad we serve a God, as we learned last week, that says... Tradition don't matter. Amen. Your rules and your regulations don't apply to God. He makes the rules and He makes the regulations. Right. Not up to you and me to make rules and regulations. Not up to you and me to be in charge. It's in His hands. Amen. And he's the boss and He's going to make sure that it's done whether we like it or not, the way that He wants it to be done. So, of course, the Pharisees didn't like that because He was breaking their social standards. And when you break people's traditions, they feel like they've got to move out of the way. That's why they didn't like Jesus. <laughs> Felt like he was coming in and taking over. Amen. Amen. That was his job. As God was to come in and take over. Right. That's why we have such a problem with giving up our traditions and giving up our uh, rights and freedoms. I'm not talking about rights and freedoms of Americans, but I'm talking about we don't want to give up what we want to do. We want, it, we want it what God wants for us to have as long as it's what we want. Right. So they had an issue with Jesus because of that. But the miracle that we're looking at in this chapter is perhaps the most familiar to many uh, because it's the greatest miracle, in my opinion, that Jesus Christ ever performed. Who in the world could take five fish and two loaves of bread and turn it into a meal that fed 5,000 people? Anybody been able to do that today? We had a good old feast, but it wasn't just some fish and bread, amen? Only God can do something like that. Only God can do something like that. He took a little boy's lunch and fed 5,000 men, not counting the women and children that were there. I believe it wasn't just men. I believe there were women and children there, which means that there were more than 5,000 people that ate from this meal that Jesus prepared from some fish and a couple of breadsticks. Many times we may feel like the little boy in the chapter that we just read. We may feel like we don't have anything significant to offer God. We're just a little church. What can we give to God? We ain't got no money. We broke. We poor. We ain't got nothing to give to God. Little as much when God, God is, is in it. it. As right. long as you give, as long as you do, as long as you do what God leads, God will bless it. Amen? Amen. Problem is, we get so caught up in what we don't have that we forget that he can take it and multiply it into something a whole lot better than what right. we think we've got. Amen. Yep. Give you three ways to show you that he's the multiplier tonight. And we'll go to the house. Number one, don't focus on your limited ability. Hmm. Don't focus on your limited ability. You know what the first thing I want to do? Well, let's read these verses one more time. Verses one through six. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were deceased. And Jesus went up into a mountain and there he sat with his disciples and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Which shall we be by bread that these may eat? This he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Think about that for a minute. 
One of the reasons we don't see God performing miracles in our lives is because we spend all of our time focusing on what we can't do. Right. What was Philip's answer to Jesus when he said, go and buy bread? Well, how are we going to afford that? <laughs> how are we going to go get enough bread to feed all these people? Where, there ain't even a subway around here. They didn't have subway back in. Where are they going to get that Italian herb and cheese bread at? Where are they going to get that wheat bread that they need to feed all these people? We ain't got the funds for that. We can't do that. I love how God works. Y'all do realize that I started this. this <laughs> and y'all know exactly where we're at. You know where your mind's at. And I love the Lord. And I love the way that he works. Sunday night studies. My first Sunday night here. We started in the book of John chapter number 1. We're now in John chapter number 6. Where it's talking about multiplying. And not depending on what we've got. But depending on what God has. Which he owns cattle on a thousand hills. And it's amazing to me that. Even though I've missed Sunday nights and we weren't able to do it uh, because we had other preachers and I went on vacation and this and that, tonight is the night that we're talking about this right when we're in the middle of the church knowing what we need. Amen? Amen. God is in control of everything. I love Him. This is not me picking and choosing out of the Word of God what I want to preach. This is God putting it right before our feet what He's got for us, what He wants us to have. Amen? Amen. I can't, can't even play this out the way that I want to. It's God. There will be times in our life and in our church here at Webb's Chapel when God is going to speak to us. There will be times when He's going to call us to do something that is bigger than ourselves, something that seems impossible. When we look at it, ain't no way it's going to happen. Just like we talked about last week, ain't no way that Jesus could have come from a virgin. If you ask any doctor, that's what they'll tell you. Do you know what the Word of God says? He came from a virgin. You know what I believe? He came from a virgin. Amen. Somebody will tell you that you're crazy if you believe that the Red Sea was parted. They say that that water wasn't the, when the when the Pharaoh and them and scientists tell you that when the Pharaoh drowned and all of his men drowned, the, the water was only about three foot. That shows you how big your God is. Amen. If the water's only three foot and they drowned in three foot, that means God had a big part in that. Amen. That show you how little their brains are and how big our God is. But people say things are impossible all the time. God says, I can do it if you just put your faith and your trust in me and not yourself and what you've got. In this case, Jesus turns to Philip and says, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? This was more than just a question. It was a test of faith. Verse number 6 tells us that Jesus already knew what he was going to do. He already knew. He was testing Philip to see what his response was. Jesus says, I want you to do this, Web Chapel Baptist Church, but we ain't got what we need to do it. God says, you've got me. That's all you need. Put right. faith in me. Yep. God says, you've got me. Trust me. God says, I can do it. If you'll just let me do it, I can do it. But you've got to let me do it. Think about the situation for a second. It was impossible. There's no way that Philip was going to pull it off on himself. Like I said a minute ago, there ain't no subway. There ain't no food line. You can't go to the nearest store and buy loaf bread and wheat bread and all that good stuff. All you got is nothing. Philip didn't even have anything to offer. He had absolutely nothing to offer. It was the little lad's lunch that was offered. He didn't have anything. And when it comes to God, you know what me and you have to offer? Absolutely nothing anyway. Amen. Everything that we have is God's anyway. And that lunch was what God provided for that little boy to bring before all those people to feed them. That paycheck that you get, whether it's from Social Security, whether it's from a retirement fund, whether it's from food stamps, whether it's from working a job, it really doesn't matter. It's all from God, amen? amen. He gave you the ability to be able to work all those years. He gave me, he gives me the ability to be able to preach. He gives you the ability to go to work every single day. He gave you seniors the ability to be able to do what you've done all your life so that you can get a check now. It's all God, amen? amen. It ain't us. It ain't Biden. It ain't Trump. It ain't the government. It's God, amen? amen. And everything that we have belongs to Him anyway, so we ought to be willing to give everything to Him. Right. Not just what we want. Amen. What He's asking us to do today, it's funny, we just talked about all that stuff. What is impossible task is He calling us to do? There is, this is where faith comes in. This is where trust comes in. This is where we truly live what we said we believe. Look at verse 7. This is what Philip's answer to Jesus was when he asked him, where are we going to get bread? Or this is, yeah. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them make a little. He said, we ain't got enough. Jesus said, we need bread. Philip said, we ain't got enough. How many times do we do that? We focus on what we don't have. Our right. limited ability. Yep. 
Every one of us are limited in what we can do. You may be the richest person in here tonight, but you're still limited on certain things. Amen. You can have the whole world at your feet still be limited at certain things that only God can give you. Right. No one can get into heaven on their own. You're really limited when it comes to that. Philip kind of missed the point. He was trying to solve the problem on his own. And that's exactly what we do. We try to do it ourselves. Well, if people would give more, we could do it. No, if you would give more. If I would give more. It ain't about everybody else. Yep. It's about you and me and our relationship with mm -hmm. the Lord. Amen. Well, if so-and-so would do that, no, it's not about so-and-so. Mm -hmm. It's about me and you. Mm -hmm. God ain't going to come to you and deal with somebody else's issues. Mm -hmm. That ain't the way God works. Mm -hmm. God's going to come to you and deal with you. And if you don't get it right, God's going to deal with you. Mm -hmm. He doesn't come to me about y'all's business. Sometimes it does, but when I'm preaching, that's when I cover it. Amen. <laughs> The problem is I don't know whose business is what. I'm just throwing darts everywhere. Like I said this morning, I ain't aiming at nobody, but if I hit you, praise the Lord. The shoe fits where it said it can't be done. We do the same thing. God calls us to do something. We immediately start coming up with reasons why I can't do it. Right. I ain't got this or I ain't got that. Yep. What Jesus wanted Philip to say was, I can't do this, but Lord, you can had Philip have said that right then, Jesus would have been satisfied. But that ain't what we do. We try to look at everything the way that God doesn't want us to look at it. Because why? We've got these man eyes. We ain't got these heavenly eyes yet. And we see certain things spiritually, but we still don't see it all spiritually the way that God sees it. His ways are not our ways. And when God's in full control, he's in full control. That's what he means. He want, everybody says, Jesus is my co-pilot. Y'all ever seen them bumper stickers? Jesus shouldn't be the co-pilot. Jesus ought to be the pilot. Amen. And not just over one thing, but over everything. Over your finances, he ought to be the pilot. Over your duties in the church, he ought to be the pilot. Over your family and your house, he ought to be the pilot. Amen. Too many times we try to do it on our own when God says, just let me handle it. When I knew God was calling me to preach, it scared me because I knew I'd never done it before. I knew I was scared to death. Can I be honest with you tonight? Amen. And I think I told y'all this my first time when y'all was talking to us. <coughs> when y'all called me to be your, or when we discussed being pastor and all that stuff, I was terrified. You say, why? Because I'd never done it before. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what I was stepping into. I had no idea who you were. You have no idea who I was. Now we've got to know each other, know each other a little bit better. But then we didn't know each other. Only thing that, that you knew that the pulpit committee knew that I preached, and that was it. They had heard me. That was what you based your whole decision on, and the Lord. Amen. And the Lord. I hope that's what you based your decision on. I based my decision on what God was doing, amen, and what God, the way that God was leading us. I, I told you when I first came, I ain't in charge of nothing. I'm just here along for the ride. God's in control of this thing. Amen. But I was scared to death. Still scared to death. You never know what could happen. Me and Brother Clyde was talking about that just a few minutes ago. You never know what could direction things could go. But you know what? I've got a God in heaven that's going to take care of me and I ain't worried about it. No matter what way anything goes. But it scared me. I remember the first time that I preached. I preached for about five minutes. And I'm so glad I didn't move around like I do now. God, the Lord's helped me out a little bit. Gave me more comfort and peace with it. But I'll never forget the first time I ever preached. I preached... Five things that are not impossible with God. I knew my whole family was going to be there. And they were. Everybody there was there except for maybe three or four people in my family. And I knew exactly what I was going to preach on. Five things that were impossible with God. And it was five things I knew my whole family was struggling with. You know, I was only, I was only 16, 17 years old. I was a fireball. I, 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 I think that night I preached against cigarettes. I preached against alcohol. I preached against anything and everything you can name. Just, just, just to tell them the truth, to get them the truth. Then I took them to Jesus after all that. But my knees were like this. Like I was literally shaking just like this the whole time I was up there. For the whole five minutes, my knees were shaking. I was terrified. It's awful. But you know what? By God's grace, I'm here today. Amen. My knees ain't shaking. My knees ain't shaking. I'm preaching a little longer than five minutes tonight. It wasn't long after that that I realized something. It ain't about me. It's about Him. Amen. 
When we get so caught up in us, we live in a, a society where it's me, 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 me. I don't know if y'all have noticed young people today, but they're always doing this. <laughs> Amen. Selfie. It's in the name, selfie. Selfish. You know why it's called a selfie? Because they can't spell narcissistic. <laughs> all you see, and it ain't just young people. It's all y'all on Facebook. Every single one of you got a profile picture if you're on Facebook, including myself. I didn't take mine, though. Somebody else did, and I put it on there. But we're so caught up in what we want. We're so caught up in the desires of our heart and what limited abilities we have that we forget we've got a God with limit, unlimited possibilities. Mm -hmm. He can do anything if he can feed 5,000 people. It wasn't long after that that I realized that God can use me. Not because I want to be used of God, but because God wants to use me. It ain't me. This standing up here preaching tonight is not me. It's the Lord helping me, Amen. pushing me, guiding me. Me studying at the house, it ain't me. It's the Lord guiding me, showing me what I need to preach and what I need to do. Tonight, don't focus on your limited ability. Number two, don't limit God by doubting His abilities. Don't limit God by doubting His abilities. Look with me at verse number eight. One of His disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fish. He's on a roll. He's got faith in his heart. He said, hey, there's a young man here. He's got, he's got, he's got food. He, he's got food. He, he's got fish and bread. He brought it with him. As always. But what are they among so many? What are they among so many? Read this and I felt like just encouraging Andrew along. I mean, he's on the right track. He's looking at the, what God has given, what God's already done, but then he limits it and says, well, it can't feed everybody. You're crazy if you think this fish and bread's going to take care of all these people. You done lost your mind, Lord. What's wrong with you? You can't do that. How many times do we say that? Lord, I'm pulling my hair out trying to figure out what I need to do. And God says, absolutely nothing. Let me handle it. Amen. Amen. That's the problem. We focus on our limited abilities, and then we doubt what God can do. Don't doubt God. Don't limit God by doubting his abilities. Keep in mind, to, it's amazing to me that Andrew had been with Jesus from the start. He's already seen Jesus turn water into wine. He's already seen Jesus heal the man who was crippled for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda that we talked about last uh, two weeks ago. He knew what Jesus was capable of. You imagine being one of these guys and seeing Jesus perform these miracles and still not believing that he can do it? To me, that would be crazy. It's right before your eyes, and yet you're still questioning God. Every single day, we're the exact same way. That's right. He's fed you. He's clothed you. He's got money in the bank for you. He's given you vehicles. He's given you uh, grandchildren. He's given you children. He's fed your children. He's fed your grandchildren. You don't have anything to ask for. you got a roof over your head, clothes on your back. God is good, amen? amen. So why do we doubt Him? Why do we doubt Him? That ministry killer word there that Andrew used. But. We can have a great ministry here at Webb's Chapel, but. We can do a lot of things here at Webb's Chapel, but. We can do this or we can do that, but. Don't throw that but in there. Say, we're going to do it. Right. Yeah. We're going to do it. Not by our power, because we're limited. By His power. That's the faith that I'm talking about. Faith in Him, not faith in your pastor. I done told you. You put me on a pedestal, I'll fall right off. I'll fall right off. You put God on a pedestal and you put your faith in Him and what He can do. His ability and power is unlimited. That's <clears throat> Someone asked me not long ago if God is real. Then why don't we see miracles like the ones in the Bible? God's not the problem. We are. Amen. We are. God's always at work all around us. He's always calling us to join Him in His work. He's always calling us to do the impossible. But we're the ones that limit Him. We limit His ability to do miracles through us, not because God can't do them, but because we won't allow God to work through us because we're so focused on what 
we think God can't do or what we know that we can't do. It's because when it comes down to it, and here it is, this is what it boils down to, we don't have the faith of a mustard seed. You know how big a mustard seed is? Tiny. And yet God said that kind of faith can move a whole mountain. What's holding us back? Our faith. If we want to live out the kind of faith that we say we have, if we want to experience the miracles, then we've got to get off of our butts, B-U-T-S, and start trusting God. We've got too many butts in our life. But, but, but. Number one, don't focus on your limited abilities. Number two, don't limit God by focusing on your limited abilities. Amen. Number three, trust God to use what you give. Trust God to use what you give. Look with me at um, 10, verse, at verse 10 through 14. And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they got, I'm sure, just imagine the look on their face. I'm sorry, i got to say this. When he said, don't lose the fragments, that'll be, make sure that you have enough basket to put all the fragments in. They're probably looking at, you lost your mind. There's two fish and two bread. There ain't nothing there to, to, to get lost. <laughs> sorry. Verse um, 13. Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley with loaves which remained over and about unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet should come into the world. Trust God to use what you give. Um, in the 8th chapter of Mark, y'all turn over there, Mark, Mark chapter number 8. I meant to say this earlier. If you study this uh, miracle, uh, it is the only one that is mentioned in all four of the Gospels. We're going to go back to Mark. Chapter number 8. We'll be in verse number 10 when you get there. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came into the parts of Dalmunatha. I don't even know how to say that. Dalmanutha. And to the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, What? Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. I think about this. After Jesus fed 4,000 people in a similar way, Mark tells us that the Pharisees came up to Jesus and asked him for a miraculous sign. And Mark says that Jesus sighed deeply. This is what I picture. They come up to him and said, Lord, give us a sign. How many of y'all done that? This week, probably, some of you. Lord, give me a sign. Lord, I need to know it. it's the right thing. I know you're telling me to do it, but I need to make sure it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And the Lord, I believe, he goes... <laughs> you don't need a sign I told you to do it do it Lord give us a sign Lord how many times have your kids come up to you and asked you for the humpteenth time for the same thing and you just go oh, I wish they'd shut up sometimes I believe the Lord looks at us like that not in a mean way not in a hateful way but just like don't they get it I've told them and I've told them and I've told them and I've told them, 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 and I've told them. We're stubborn. We talk about the Jews being stubborn. We're stubborn. Yeah. I just love the picture. I think that's probably what Jesus did after testing Philip and Andrew. Right here, he's done fed them all, and now they're looking for another sign or looking for another miracle, and Jesus says, didn't you just see what I did? Didn't you just see the miracles that I've already performed for you? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I believe he was signed because of their lack of faith. See, Jesus knew what he was going to do. He always knows what he's going to do. Amen. We're the ones that have trouble because we don't know what he's going to do. 
He just wanted Philip and Andrew to be the ones who trusted in him enough to suggest it. You already know what God wants. It's already, he's already planted it in our hearts. We know the right way to go. The question is, are we going to have enough faith to do it? I think he does the same thing with us. When he calls us to do something that seems impossible, and we reply by saying, but, I think he sighs just like that. And then he either turns to someone else, or he does it on his own, on his own and we're the ones who miss out. Because we said but instead of just doing what God wanted us to do. I believe there's a lot of blessings that go to other people that should have been the one to somebody. Because you know, the job's going to get done. Whether it's done by Webb's Chapel Baptist Church or whether it's done by Anthony Grove or whether it's done by such and such. We could go on down the line. God's got a job for us to do. And if we don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. And they're going to get the glory and they're going to get the prize and they're going to get the crown. I say let's take it. I say let's do it. Let's have some faith in this place. Amen? Amen. He does the same thing to us. In this case, Jesus took over and he fed the crowd himself. And he showed us what could have been. He said, I'll just do it myself. <laughs> Jesus wasn't asking Philip and Andrew to feed the people. Never once did he say, I want you to feed all these people. He didn't say that. He already knew what he was going to do. He just wanted them to believe he could do it. He knew they didn't have the resources. He knew they didn't have the ability. He knew it was impossible for them. What Jesus wanted was for Philip and Andrew to come to him with what they had and say, this is it. It's all we have. Do something with it. That's where we fail. Yeah. Too busy looking at what we shouldn't look at. We've got our eyes on this and got our eyes on that. When God says, I can do it if you'll just trust me. You let me have your life. Oh, I can do something big with it. Each and every one of us. There's something wrong. There's nothing wrong with God. He wants to take our inabilities and He wants to multiply them together and do miracles in our lives, in our community, and in the world around us. You say, How are we going to do it? Through Him. Amen. Through Him. How are we going to make an impact? Brother Chris, you come up to me the other night, you talked to me on the phone. The main thing we're talking about this tonight. You said, How can we get into the community? How can we, when we share and, and through him. Whatever he lays on your heart to do, do it. That's how. Yep. Through him. If he lays something on your heart, let's do it. Let's get her done. We can do it. Amen. Amen. Not really. He can do it. Right. But we can do it through him. What is God asking you to do? Trust him by responding to his word. Go ahead and leave your I can't down here at the altar. Leave your butts down here at the altar. Get up off those butts. And let's do something for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Off of them I can't. And end up saying, Lord, I can. Y'all stand up. Told you we'd get out early tonight. Well, you got something or 